if we look forward 20 years, mm -hmm. what products from today do you think they're gonna be profiling and going, wow, look at this crazy stuff. I can't believe we got one of these that works. You gotta wow. see this. That's tough. So I love this concept of retro tech, the stuff that I grew up with, maybe you didn't, you did not quite grow up with, uh, but it's still fascinating to everybody. What made you start thinking about this and say it's worth more than just, you know, a tweet or one video, it's worth doing a whole show about? Yeah, well, so I've, I mean, my whole channel now is, is new tech, new tech, what just came out, should you spend your money on this thing? Uh, that's always been the evaluation. And so at a certain point, I sort of started looking back at this little group of tech that was like right before my time, um, whether it was something collecting dust in the basement or, uh, or if I hadn't like fully understood uh, this piece of tech that came before me. And so it eventually sort of piled together into this curiosity about this retro tech and how impactful it really has been. So that's, that was the genesis for the idea. We just looked back and, and picked a few good ones. Right, so much of that stuff is impactful in terms of not just what it does, the functionality, but also the industrial design, the sort of retro modernism. They were trying to look so futuristic, yeah. but today it looks so boxy, like a yeah. 70s car. Um, and, and I think that's part of the fascination people have, even though all tech is by definition almost always useless. Half of it doesn't work anymore. You don't have the support services, the whatever it needs. Uh, you know, why are we still so fascinated with, with this physical ephemera of a, of a bygone age? Yeah. It's so different, and I think the difference is really what makes it intriguing. I remember one of the things that I, that I look back at, almost every single one of these pieces of retro tech without fail has these really satisfying buttons, and they have this really tactile, you know, the keyboard on the 84 Macintosh, and the buttons on the Walkman, and all these things, uh, are, they just feel different. So that part of it sort of sticks with it, even if it's not as useful. And then the other thing is is just the analog, uh, the, the nostalgia of it, really, is when you go back to like the sound of hearing portable music for the first time, or literally the first time people could take a photo and see the photo they just took, um, that sort of like cultural nostalgia is really what, what stays with people. So I think that's what's really interesting about it. I love what you said about the visceral satisfaction of the click of the buttons, yeah. because I think these things were built to last, uh, because a lot of the things that you profiled, whether it's the Game Boys or the, or the, or the Mac keyboard or the camera, they, they still kind of work. They haven't fallen apart completely yet because they built them to last back then, because yeah. they have the big switches and the big buttons. And today, I feel like everyone just cheaps out on that. The buttons are not meant to last. It's almost like it's disposable. Yeah, it was interesting. Every single one of those six pieces of tech that we got to use, we did get to, to work. Now, the hardest one was the Dynatac because that's the, the first ever mobile phone. There are no 1G networks floating around. So what we actually had to do is we had to get two working Dynatacs, which that's hard by itself. Um, got them both online and we essentially created our own little 1G network in my studio and we made a phone call from a Dynatac to a Dynatac, to and it did sound about like a normal phone call. Um, but yeah, the Walkman still plays tapes, the 1984 Macintosh still booted up. Um, these things are, are definitely built different than they are now. There's a built-in obsolescence now yeah. uh, that I think you didn't have back then because these people expected you'd use that camcorder or that Walkman forever. You'd never, no one would ever invent anything better. Right, they weren't, they weren't necessarily making something with the expectation of having a next year's model. Um, that they hoped you'd upgrade to. So this this whole you know iPhone 10, iPhone 11, iPhone 12 thing. Even though we don't upgrade every year, they're they're building these products with the next year in mind. So I think back in these formative days of you know these different industries, when we weren't thinking about the next year's product, we got some really radical, solid stuff. Out of it. What was your first music player? Okay, um, I had a an old purple Sony. CD player, uh -huh. um, and I, I right before that I had sort of floating around in my memory. I had a tape player and I had a couple tapes, but that CD player was my first like personal. Was it a portable? It was. Yeah, it was, it was portable. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it was portable. Yeah. It was like I a could, disc man. You could put it on your belt. It didn't go in your pocket, yes. but like that was my first. And I had wired wired headphones, and you could yeah. walk around with it. Um, and then I got an iPod Touch. Oh, nice. And that changed obviously everything for my media collection, but I do remember the CD player. Man, the CD players back then, they eventually had that hybrid where the first iPod came out and not everyone could afford an iPod. Uh, so you got the, the Discman style player that could play a burned disc of MP3 files, 
But, but, but you skipped that phase and went right to the iPod Touch. Yeah, 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 because I didn't necessarily need, I was in elementary school and then middle school around this time, so I didn't need to like bring it to class with me. It was more of like a cool thing where I was in my bedroom listening to music by myself. It was like no one else can hear it, so that was my use for it. But uh, eventually, it was in high school that I got my iPod Touch. Yeah, that touch was such an entry point for so many people because you didn't need the phone service for it. Yep. It was kind of like almost as cool as having an iPhone. I think it's the first modern Apple product I owned also. First mobile web browser for me, mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. uh, first iPod for me, first a lot of things, yeah. Do you still have a Zune in a closet somewhere? Oh man, I did have a Zune HD. Nice. Strangely nice. enough, I don't know how many kids had a Zune HD and an iPod Touch in their life, but I did and I might still have that Zune HD. Did you ever see the one guy who had the Zune tattoo? Tattoo? Yeah, oh, some dude was like the that. one Zune fan and he got a Zune <laughs> tattoo. Man. I, I think I read that he eventually got it covered up. I don't blame him. When you were a kid, what did you lust after tech-wise that you never got to have? Uh, and maybe started some of this retro tech uh, nostalgia for you? Definitely. Um, there was a time when, so I have two things. One was the first camera I ever used. Um, it was an early JVC handheld tape camcorder, very similar to the GRC one we did a mm -hmm. video about. Um, but I never got to like bring that footage into any sort of editing suite. So I always was just like watching back the footage on the one tape I had. And if I wanted to make something else, I would record over it. So I never really got to get into that. Those I just lost wanted, archives. Yeah, those, oh, no. that unseen footage is crazy. Um, and the other thing I can think of is actually the original iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, this was, again, high school, so, you know, maybe a couple kids had one. But I was on Verizon at the time, and, of course, it was a singular AT&T mm -hmm. thing, so I never had that switch. I was on my parents' cell phone plan, whatever. So I got the LG Voyager, and right after that was the, the original Moto Droid. Oh, nice. So, you know, at the time, a lot of them are taking inspiration from the iPhone, and I certainly saw the benefit of that, but I never really, until this year, owned an original iPhone. What game console did you have first with a kid? And are you, I, I never get a sense that you're a huge gamer. I, I see you play, I, you talk about it sometimes, but, but you, don't, you don't talk about it a ton. You sensed me correctly. My first game console was a PS4. Yeah. So I had a friend that had a GameCube back in the day, but I was never really, I don't even know if it's my parents, like you can't have one, but like I never really, got that far into gaming where I had my own console, never had a Game Boy, never had a GameCube, never had a PS1, PS2. Um, so it was finally when I went to college that I was like, wait, I can just get my own now. So I did get a PS4. Um, I do have an Xbox One now, but yeah, I hadn't really been a super hardcore gamer. I guess technically you could say my first game console was my PC because mm -hmm. I played PC games on occasion. I had Need for Speed, Most Wanted, of course, my favorite of course. game of all time. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have my own console until that PS4. So how hard was it to find uh, and source some of the stuff? I, I know that I know that some things are easy. You see them all over the place, but some yeah. th some of the things you you profiled are a bit on the obscure side. Yeah. So we literally had a team for this. So I didn't necessarily have my hands on like going into eBay and finding and like vetting which ones seemed legit, which ones were newer than others. Um, but I can tell you that the team found that the Dynatac was the most difficult one. And we didn't really necessarily go about getting like unopened packages. What we just cared about was having the original things, the original accessories, and maybe the original packaging. I know that they were all pretty difficult, but the Dynatac was the hardest one. One thing I loved about the show is the way you guys loop in all this retro footage yeah. of people talking about, welcome to the world of the computer. I love you know, that. All, 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 this, all this vintage, almost industrial film footage. Mm -hmm. um, the way that we talk about technology now, do you think we are self-aware enough that they're not gonna use some of this footage in 20, 30, 40 years, and we're gonna sound like we're going, you can speak to someone on the other side of the country. It's crazy, I think we are turning into that. And the only reason I say that is because I have used old footage of myself to, to, to make that same point. So yeah, we have like all that crazy archive footage of like Hillary Clinton playing the Game Boy on Air Force One, like this crazy throwback stuff. and. True, when the tech is that new, you get these wild claims about it and how crazy they, they are. But um, yeah, when I, when I pulled up the Mac Pro review for the first time, and this machine has 384 gigs of RAM, which is insane. But I remember looking back at some of my old videos where uh, a terabyte of storage on my laptop was like oh, unfathomable. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I can't believe I can get a terabyte hard drive, let alone an SSD. And now we're looking at you know a terabyte of available RAM storage on the Mac Pro. So. When we talked about some of the old game consoles, you mentioned the GameCube. 
uh, which is, I think, what everyone would love to see now in those little, you know, those retro rewind boxes they make now, the SNES Classic, the Genesis Classic, everyone saying, oh, they should make a GameCube Classic. Um, is that just pure nostalgia for old people, or do you think people are actually interested in these old games in their relatively original form, just in a little box with the mini controller? Yeah, I, I think nostalgia is really powerful and has a lot to do with it. I remember even um, the new Razer that Motorola was making with yes. the folding screen. They are leaning so hard into the nostalgia oh, so for funny. good reason. Because if you take a step back, that's not an amazing phone. It's a what is it, a $1,500, but has a very small battery and not the newest software or, si or chip. But when you package it with that nostalgia, people really get attached to it. I've seen tweets about how much, how much they want it and they don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, I think the nostalgia is super powerful with a lot of this older tech, and that's that's definitely true. You mean having a screen that's basically like this is, is not the most useful type of screen in the world? It's, I can't believe it's it. It's not the most practical thing, but people just, just want it. What have you learned over the years uh, about making videos, about talking about technology? What would you tell your younger self? Because I feel like your style, not just your style has evolved, but, but the way you look at it, uh, your analysis, your kind of big picture. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it just comes from context. So when I was first starting out, I didn't have the context of the rest of the tech world. I'd get a laptop, and that was my only laptop, and my entire analysis of it was in this world of how great it is and what it can do. Um, now, 11 years later, we have the context of other laptops I've tested and the rest of the industry and the price range that you can select from. So I guess if it was, if it was advice for my younger self, I would I'd probably tell myself to consider the wider range of available options uh, when, re when evaluating something. Um, but I also am happy to have learned that over time, and I feel like that makes the videos that I make better. How has your kit evolved over time? I know that you you use the same equipment for a long time. You're not you're not upgrading every week to like brand new stuff. Do you feel it's more important to be comfortable with the gear you use? Because I know you have a very small crew. Yeah. Um, or or is it important to you know get the new stuff when it first comes out? For me, uh, I really like to have new stuff. But uh, yeah, the kit I've gotten comfortable with over time, and I generally only upgrade when I. Feel like I've arrived at a limit or something that I want to do that I can't or something that would make it better. So I first started with uh, the, the webcam and the laptop. Mm -hmm. Natural upgrade was getting a separate camera so I could point it at things. Uh, so I had a Sanyo Zacti camera which is my first camera with autofocus so I could get it to focus on things and, and that was sort of interesting. Then I moved on because I couldn't get good enough high definition quality and wanted other lenses so I got a DSLR, Canon T2i. So you, you sort of find your your reasons to upgrade over time. At this point, I've ended up with uh, a red Monstro 8K VistaVision. I don't see myself needing to upgrade anytime soon, um, but I do feel very comfortable with the kit and, and a lot of those lenses with the Canon mount, now that I've shot Canon for 10 years, uh, I've gotten very comfortable with, so I, I really like that glass. Now, you shoot, mo you shoot everything in 4K now, right? Or do you do the full 8? So we shoot in 8K, wow. which uses the entire sensor, but yep, then we'll yep. crop down and mm -hmm. you get a little extra sharpness, but you can also reframe without losing detail, yep. so we do shoot in 8K. And how long have you been doing that? Um, since the, hmm, about three years, I think. Oh, wow. Since the, the, the real, first 8K Real early sensor. adopter on the 8K stuff, yeah. Yeah, and nice. it wasn't even, you know, it could have been 6K. It wasn't necessarily, sure. you know, more pixels is better, but I remember, the first ever 4K camera I shot with, which was the red Scarlet W when I was in college. Yeah. And I didn't even necessarily need to publish in 4K, but I was just, I had so much more information in every frame that it was, it was beautiful to me. So uh, yeah, these new sensors are incredible. When, when you put together a video, are you thinking about a particular screen size? Do you try to shoot for viewability on you know, a phone screen above all? What, what do you think your primary screen is? Scorsese talks about this all the time now. Like, don't watch the Irishman on a phone screen. Yep. I mean, that's where we are, dude. Yeah, yeah, there's sort of two answers to that. One is uh, I am aware that more than half my viewers are watching it on a phone screen, and almost nobody, even if they do watch it on a, a 5K iMac, is actually watching it in the highest resolution possible. So I'm aware of, of you know, things that are very broad in general, like framing and, and exposure and color, of getting those to look great on a phone. But I do want to make them look amazing. So if there are people, and just the couple of people who are watching it on a high resolution screen, or that do watch it for the cinematography or, or appreciate that aspect of it, then they will have something to appreciate when I spend the extra hour and a half on color or on sharpness or something that almost no one will notice. 
and I export it and, and I watch it back on the 6K Pro Display XDR and I can see what I've done, then hopefully a couple people will appreciate that too. If we look forward 20 years plus Marquez Jr., maybe Dan the Third, we're making RetroTech mm -hmm. uh, 20, you know, 45. Mm -hmm. What products from today do you think they're gonna be profiling and going, wow, look at this crazy stuff. I can't believe we got one of these that works. So you gotta wow. see this. That's tough. So I like, I, I think a lot of the stuff we're looking at now has ended up uh, as like mature markets. So we're, we're not gonna look at like the iPhone 11 as like the piece that changed history. Something that came to mind when you said that was Tesla Model S as like electric cars didn't really have a, a, a place before Tesla came along. Mm -hmm. And now they're really carving out their place. And I think Tesla Model S uh, and the success of it and then Tesla Model 3, but I think that that first big one they had is a big reason for it. So I think if they could look back at an old car, they might they might pull up a, an old Tesla with a dead battery. Um, and let me let me give one more, which would be, this is gonna sound so stupid, but I'm gonna stick with it. Google Glass. Oh yeah. Because you look at AR and VR and, and it's sort of a merging thing and you get like, you get the headsets now, everyone's got their own little version of AR or VR. And Glass, Back in the day, there was an argument that it was ahead of its time. Maybe it's a little awkward it having it on your face. Maybe the camera's too much for people and it died. But if, if VR and AR ever take off like they might, we might look back at like Google Glass as being one of those formative, you know, tests for humans for AR. And if it doesn't take off, we'll be looking at like the Oculus Rift and say, look, people used to think this was going to be a big consumer product. Yeah, it might flop and all of our interviews talking about the future of VR might look really silly, but hey. I like it. So tune back in 2045, mm -hmm. uh, Tesla S, Google Glass, and yeah. Oculus Rift. Retro Thank you, Marcus Brownlee. Retro Tech. <laughs> Thanks for having me.